going to read you a prayer that I wrote to the Shekhinah, the indwelling feminine presence in the Jewish tradition. And so staying in a contemplative space, receiving this as a prayer, as a blessing, as an invocation. O oh, Shekhinah, yours is the feminine face of the holy, the luminous moon who lights up the night as we travel from captivity to liberation, the pillar of fire who guides our way home, the cloud hovering over the mountain peaks, living sign that the drought is over. You are the indwelling presence of the divine. Whenever we gather to praise the one, you are here in our midst. When we cry out for justice, you make our hearts tender. When we stand up with those on the margins, you make our legs strong. When we create works of art and parent our children and harvest our gardens, you guide and sustain us. You are the Sabbath bride, the beloved, returned from exile. You restore balance in our relationships and wholeness to our fragmented souls. You infuse our lovemaking with honey. You fill the cup of our hearts, which tremble with longing, with the wine of your answering love. You are the song of our homecoming. You are the Sabbath queen, the great mother who sits at the heart of the table, tearing off hunks of the secret bread that contains the exact flavor each of us loves best. You feed us all, the proud and the repentant, the believer and the skeptic from your own hands. Your unconditional forgiveness dissolves otherness. O Shekhinah, we are the vessel for your inflowing. Your, your radiance requires the clay of our embodiment. Your flame burns at the core of the earth. Your warmth penetrates the seedbed and animates the seedlings. You bless the head of every animal and kiss the tear-streaked face of humanity. You are the vision that builds community and you are our refuge when the fabric of community unravels. Be with us now as we navigate this landscape of mystery where your most cherished attributes, wild mercy and boundless compassion, righteousness and wisdom seem to be cast aside and trampled by imperious world powers and we are paralyzed by helplessness. Help us. May we remember you and lift you up. May we recognize your face and celebrate your beauty in everything and everyone, everywhere, always. Amen. So even if, you, even if Judaism is not your tradition, you can go ahead and appropriate the Shekhinah. She belongs to you. She belongs to everybody, and, and we belong to her. And she lives in the Sabbath. Like the Sabbath in Judaism. How many Jewish people in this room? OK, so you know this. this Shabbat is feminine. She is the bride and she's the queen. She is 
the embodiment of the Shekhinah. She is imminence. She is the transcendent Holy One pouring in to the body, to community, to family. She is our connection to the earth. She's our connection to sexuality and sensuality. She's our connection to the other animals. The Shekhinah is the embodied, indwelling presence of the feminine, of the divine. She is, um, as my friend Eve Ilson, Reb Zalman, Shakhtar Shalomi's widow, says, she's not Mrs. God. <laughs> as, as Kali and Durga in the, are in the Hindu tradition, they are also, the, they are God. They are God. They're not like the girl God. And so Shekhinah is, is the divine here in our human experience. And she is said to be exiled most of the time, to live in exile, except on Shabbat, when we light those Sabbath candles on Friday as the sun goes down. We welcome her. We welcome the Sabbath. We welcome the Shekhinah. And then on Saturday when the sun sets again, she goes back into exile, it is said. And it's a heartbreaking moment. In fact, it's so sad, sorrowful, and painful that there's a ritual, Havdalah, which involves sniffing from a box of fragrant spices so that we won't faint with sorrow and longing for the sweetness and deliciousness that it is to navigate the holy land of Shabbat with the Shekhinah in our hearts. So I don't know about you, but I'm in a subversive mood. And I think it's time to welcome her back from exile so that she is with us all the time. Yeah. What do you say? Yeah. Right? Why does she have to live in exile anymore? The boys did that. <laughs> she belongs here. If the Shekhinah is about reunification of the masculine and feminine, that would explain why things have been radically out of balance. Six of the seven days of the week, we've been way skewed toward the patriarchy. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So when people say, well, it's all one, it's sort of like, I don't see color. You know, I look at you, and there's no such thing as white. There's no such thing as black. Um, bullshit. There is no such thing as masculine, feminine. The Godhead transcends all gender. I mean, yes, of course. Ultimate reality is ultimate. The absolute is not genderless, but it encompasses all, right? And the world's religious traditions, oh shoot, I keep offending people with my potty mouth. The world's traditional religions have been way skewed toward the masculine. And so we might need for a time to overemphasize a little bit or a lot uh, the feminine wisdom teachings. When I wrote Wild Mercy, I thought, okay, this will be fun. I'll just you know, take a look at the feminine wisdom teachings across the spiritual traditions. I'd love to do that. My publisher actually asked me to write that book. It was their idea. Sounds true. I thought it was a great idea. Well, not so easy. Those feminine wisdom teachings are deeply buried, and they're buried intentionally. So I felt like a spiritual archaeologist, you know, digging up the, the wisdom of the feminine across the spiritual traditions. And in some cases, it was really hard to find. Yeah, they, they, that was designed that way in, in many ways. So, um, so we're working on it. Women, men, people of all genders, are hard at work, or and joyfully at work, to rescue these feminine teachings from the, their hiding places. And so I know that this conversation that we're having, I don't mean just in this room today. This is an odd room. I, I prefer Shivananda Ashram in the Bahamas. It's like this big palapa with a thatched thing with beautiful plants. And <laughs> we're in the basement. Anyway. Um, it, it, it's nice, though. So this conversation we're having, having in this room and also just across the 
human family right now, and not only in the spiritual communities, but in politics, in in the entertainment industry, in all of the ways that humans come together and collect to express ourselves, this conversation is happening. It's so exciting, isn't it? And I mean, I think the reason this room is almost 50% men, I have, truly, I've never, I've been on the road with this book for eight months and I have never seen this percentage of, of men in um, these Wild Mercy spaces. That's why I wanted to check and make sure you hadn't made a mistake. <laughs> I'm giving you another chance now. Um, that men have been expressing as, as a profound a hunger for the wisdom of the feminine as women are and feeling as profoundly oppressed and wounded by the patriarchy as women have been, and people of, of all genders have been. So what I'd like to do now is see if there are any questions, and then I'll do a little reading, and then we'll see if there are any more questions from, from the reading. Are you, the, are you our mic? Oh, mic runner, lovely, thank you. You want me to do that? Yeah, mm. well, I, I feel like that more of a, okay, I'll do my best. And if I know you and forget your name, I'm, it's just because I don't know, those lights are in my eyes. <laughs> Anybody have anything bubbling up right now? And what I ask you to do as I invite you now to ask a question or to offer a reflection is see if you can distill it. You might want to close your eyes even and take a breath and see if there's some distilled essence of a question or a reflection that you'd like to, to vocalize now. And if not, no problem, I'll just keep talking and then I'll, we'll try that again in a little while. Yes. Oh, sorry, and then David back there. Thank you. I, I have to say I am here by mistake. Okay. Uh, but I didn't want to leave and I'm glad I didn't because you. when you, discussed the uh, feminine sh Shahina yeah. uh, descending into us, I felt uh, all of a sudden I was bathed by love wow. uh, coming into my presence. And and I thought, well, this is just what I've been missing. Mm. So I'm apparently in the right place after all. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> wow, and you distilled that beautifully. Well modeled. <laughs> Thank you. And so David over there. Mirabai, I have a sense about this, but I would love to have your words and your intuition on how this welcoming and healing and allowing forth the feminine in the masculine healing as well, how you perceive that. Can you be a little more specific, David? I feel similarly that I have a deep pain about the denial of the feminine within me, uh, somehow within my relating to the inhumanity, to a part of humanity. Mm -hmm. I feel a pain in that deeply. Um, I often have tears with that. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the mas this masculine experience that is connected to the healing of the denial, the devaluing, the diminishing of the feminine. Hmm. I'm not sure what that relationship is, really, but I know I'm moved by that healing and that it's time for that to be healed. And I feel that. So I just wondered if, from your perspective, you have any thoughts about what that bridge is, a relationship within the, the masculine that is also being healed by welcoming the feminine again, mm -hmm. or maybe for the first time. Well, I don't know if you're asking, like, is there a mechanism by which the masculine can rebalance or welcome the feminine into a more balanced way of being in the world? Or if you're actually um, expressing your own sense of, of pain, of that disconnect, and you're, and you're um, longing for that to be rebalanced in yourself by in enfolding the feminine more into your life. I mean, I know you a little bit and I feel like you're a model of that, of a man who's opening his heart to the, to the energy of, of the feminine 
and finding a balanced way to be in in the world. So I don't know if, what the question is because I think that you're that you're basically just stating that your longing to to integrate um, is real and and it sometimes causes you pain. Yes. And I think maybe this is almost a conversation, an explorative conversation of why the masculine is in such pain mm -hmm. also around right. this. That's more I'm interested in this being a conversation about that, why we hurt as yeah. well. I, 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 have a, I have a response all of a sudden Great. that's bubbling up. Um, and it has to do also with the conversation around race and around the way we treat the earth. And all of those things, the way we have marginalized women's voices and thereby given ourselves as a human community um, permission to take what we want uh, from the earth and from other human communities, this is all an artifact of this imbalance of the masculine. When we when we silence and marginalize and oppress women's voices, it makes it much easier, because the feminine is so much about embodiment, to then um, violate the earth as if it were a thing that belongs to us. And we, those of us who are waking up to this connection between the way that we treat women and the way we treat the earth are, are in it hurts to recognize that. And if we can stay present to that pain, then this, a shift in alchemy can begin to unfold by virtue of not running away from the pain that we feel. The feminine is a, is, um, a zone in which seemingly contradictory propositions coexist in the vastness of the broken open feminine heart. So the feminine looks upon the suffering of the world and doesn't say, hmm, how can I modify, repair, fix, and, and di first diagnose and then engineer a solution to these problems first, although we need all the, the engineers that we can on, on these issues, but the feminine first feels the pain of the world and allows her heart to be broken and broken open. Those of us who know that California is once again burning as we sit here have been feeling you know, in incredible grief and anguish about what's happening to our Mother Earth right in very close proximity. Um, staying with the pain and allowing it not only to hurt but to shatter us to allow ourselves to be shattered by the pain of the world is the space in which the feminine abides, lives. This is our territory. And it's from that broken open space. It's from the man feeling the pain of the way women have been oppressed. And it's from white people allowing ourselves to feel the grief and pain of our sisters and brothers of color and not run away from that pain, but be present with it, that any kind of integration and unification is possible. If we just go directly to we are all one, God has no gender, race is an illusion of our perception, then we do not allow ourselves to enter into the crucible of transformation that begins with allowing our hearts to be broken. So men who are feeling the oppression of the feminine in women and in themselves and are feeling pain, thank you. I invite you to feel it all the way. White people who are feeling like, oh my God, I actually am complicit in racism in ways I never imagined. Like I thought my old uncle Charlie from Alabama was a racist, and I'm the least racist person I know. I have five black friends, whatever. We, we think of racism as some kind of personal um, belief system, and it's taking us quite a while. White people, <laughs> contemporary white people, I'm not saying everyone in this room is, but most of us are, 
to recognize the unconscious ways, I mean, that's why they call it shadow, we can't see it unless it's pointed out, that we participate in structural racism, in institutionalized white supremacy, because it benefits us. And every, we look around and, and the world just sort of supports our dominance. Like the norm is white, in fact, the norm is white dude. And so it takes uh, an effort to, to actually come to grips with, with our own complicity in these structures that have and continue to oppress our beloved commu communities of color to which, you know, we, for, for whom we are also responsible. But, so the term white fragility is such a good one because it just, it's like our response when we feel the pain of the ways that we have participated in these structures that cause suffering is to either defend ourselves or if that doesn't work, to run away, or if that doesn't feel right, to over apologize and put the emotional burden on the people who are trying to like point out these realities to us. And that doesn't work either. And so what works? What works is to enter into the wild feminine heart and allow ourselves to be broken hearted, to let that pain dismantle us and remake us. I see a question or a reflection. And these are all connected to what I'm trying to say. Misogyny, patriarchy, oppression of the earth, and white supremacy. Do you see the ways that they're all connected? And do you see the way that the feminine heart is the healing space? Because this is the broken open heart. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to thank you. And because I know the feminine is also tender and caring and these spaces that we create together are, um, I believe our actions and our experiences inside these spaces are important. Anyway, we're about to leave. And we're leaving because we have to drive through the fire zone. Wow. And so I just wanted to say thank you. And we will take this with you, with us, and... Um, I feel like we've we've got a blessing to take with us, so that feels really good. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much for sharing that, and bless you on your way, and and the the forest where you live, and the creatures, and all of it. Lots of love to you. Thank you. Um, so the so okay, good. Now there's some questions and reflections. So let's see, Rick, and then Janai, and then the guy in the middle. <laughs> I'm going to interview Mirabai tomorrow, but I thought I'd try out a question on her. <laughs> if, it, if it's a good one, we can do it again tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we, we hear a lot about the ramifications of the dominance of the masculine. And you were just you know, itemizing some of the negative effects of that on the world. Um, do you think that if the feminine were to become as predominant as the masculine has been, that there would be a dark side to the feminine? And if so, what would some of those um, things be that we would want to, again, create some kind of balance in order to... And, and, and is there such a thing as a balance, or is the pendulum always going to swing, do you think? Okay, so that's... Okay. I have to take a breath before I answer that one. Um, it doesn't matter. Do not worry about the imbalance of an over-dominance of the feminine. We have thousands of years... <laughs> of imbalance to grapple with. And so much damage has been done that needs to be undone or needs to be mended that I just, it's sort of a non-question. Is it okay to say to uh, tell the Buddha at the gas pump dude that that was a non-question question? No, but I'm gonna come back at you. Um, okay. And I'm not worried about it. And I think it's a great, no, the sooner the better. But I'm just wondering, uh, maybe academically, is there a is there a sort of a dark side of the feminine that is that you've thought about that gets discussed? Um, just as we certainly know what the dark side of the masculine is, is there a corresponding dark side of the feminine? You really want me to answer that question? Okay. Okay. I'm try. Um, I was just sitting here wondering if a woman would ask that question, but maybe she would. Of course. 
I feel like I want to ask someone in the women to answer that question. We were quiet for far too long. We were quiet for far too long. I hear there's a there's a dark side. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Wait. Do you need the mic? Um, in answer to that question uh, from personal experience, the distortion comes from the imbalance of the feminine, the yin that is already missing, which actually distorts both both the masculine and feminine. So what we're seeing is a distorted masculine and feminine in our culture and an imbalance in the world as a result. And when the feminine rises up in us, regardless of the body we happen to be in, right. there is a restoration of wholeness where we can, we can be our wholeness of who we are in that ray of God, which expresses through our humanity. And, and it's the negation of the feminine, actually, that is, has been the problem for several thousands of years. And thank you, Mirabai, for your spiritual archaeology. Hmm. Because... My question is this. Um, we'll come back to that tomorrow, right? Yeah, come back to it. <laughs> My question is, um, you know, we, we have these depictions of the feminine, of this compassionate, merciful, loving embrace. And, um, but we're, we're missing, at least in Western culture, the fierceness. And the fierceness is needed now. And I'm not seeing it here on these stages. I mean, I'm seeing it in you, Maribai, but I'm really not seeing that represented in the non-dual community. And we need that. That is what is going to save us now. Yeah. Um, so how do we hold that? I know in myself, how do I hold both that? Because it is both and, the, the compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness, the acceptance, the embrace of what is. But there's also a fierceness that is a little scary. It is scary. Yeah. And, and it's chaotic. And it's subversive. And it, what is it subverting? It's subverting the dominant paradigm, which is the masculine paradigm. So it's messy and it's dangerous. And um, I will not try to claim that it's going to be some glorious, you know, harmonious new world that where the feminine is the dominant form. The feminine is also, you know, the goddess of destruction and undoing. And there is a collective dark night that is unfolding that has to do with radical unknowingness. And I think its flavor is the feminine. Um, and this, and the, it is the feminine that can hold space for this kind of wild um, uh, unraveling that it, that is unfolding. So yeah, I mean, the subtitle of my book is "Living the Fierce and Tender Wisdom of the of the Women Mystics." The feminine is, is capable of holding uh, a both of those, but that the Mary Meek and Mild Ike um, archetype has dominated our understanding of the spirituality of the feminine, at least in what the Western cultures, at least in Christianity, that to be a holy woman is to be subservient and, and quiet and, and um, to, to continuously uh, allow other people to, to dominate. Like I'm thinking about the vow of obedience. Um, so... One thing I was going to say or respond to with this, you said so many things, beautiful things. I'm trying to remember. There was something from early on, um, and you saying we've been quiet. That's like one of our shadow places is this kind of complicity and quiet. Oh, that's what I was going to say, is that uh, one of the ways that women in the spiritual traditions across the, the landscape of religions and spiritual traditions have attempted to take our seat and to reclaim our power is by ordination as you know, rabbis, roshis, swamis, um, and priests and ministers and so on. And that impulse, I mean, I totally get it and I bow to it and I'm grateful that there are the keepers of the jewels, the women out there who are, who are deeply seated in the world's great spiritual traditions and bringing their feminine hearts 
But there's something about that whole process of being sanctioned by these institutionalized religions that I'm questioning right now. And many of the women I know who have attained uh, great um, heights of, of respect in their, in their various spiritual traditions have often become rather brittle and ossified and dry and have sort of denied, I feel, their, the full range of the feminine heart, which also includes vulnerability. Because they've worked so fucking hard to gain and obtain any level of authority that we often feel like we have to go over into overdrive as spiritual leaders or as religious leaders to prove that we belong at that the table of the big boys. And I'm not sure I even want to sit at that table. In fact, I'm pretty darn sure I don't want to sit at that table. I want a collective fiesta that everybody um, brings their own flavor to. And that doesn't mean that I don't believe in leadership. I do. I believe that certain people need to take their seat in their authority and, and offer what is theirs to give. But there are lots of ways to be a leader. And if we do it collectively, to me, that's the feminine way. Not being a Roshi and bossing everybody around, but actually together, collectively finding our wisdom to step up and offer to this beautiful broken world. So there was a, did you still have a question? You're being very patient here and then here, here. I'm really bad at this part. So the man with the beard and then this woman here with the vest and then this other woman with the shawl. And it might have been the other way around with the you two women, but I don't remember. Thanks. So I'm speaking to, uh, I'm speaking to the issue both personally and, and generally of acknowledging and sitting with the pain, yeah. with the open heart, yeah. with the pain in this world that's been caused by the patriarchy, by the overpowering of nature, we're going to take control, et cetera, of, uh, of, of people of different cultural values, colors, women, gender. And the value that part of the, the importance we mentioned has to do, part of the aspect of the divine also has to do with the experience of being held, the experience of, by nature of being held by the, you know, uh, the Shekinah, by being held by the divine feminine, and of the collective sense of that, of, of, of having a community that allows us to stay with, we need to stay with the pain. Yeah. Not jump into what I'm going to do about it, that will come. Mm -hmm. There needs to be things that right. are done, which I see is, you know, kind of the general masculine thing, but if you skip by the wisdom of the heart yeah. and the community uh, way of doing it, of understanding it, uh, it, it, it'll it uh, go in a different direction. Beautifully distilled, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, and the fierceness is part also, but I, yeah. I, I'm sitting with that for the benefit for men, this question. Uh, for me personally, mm -hmm. um, and um, so. Thank you, thank you so much. And part of the ferocity is, is lies in truth telling. You know, telling the truth, <laughs> speaking truth to power. It takes a lot of chutzpah to do that, and um, that is what is required for women. Not so much for men, in fact, I recommend that you just like be quiet for a little while, and <laughs> women start telling the truth, telling those hard truths, and know that you're telling the truth in a circle of belonging that is not up to you. That's another artifact of the masculine, is the idea that we are these lone prophets that need to charge forth with our swords of unconditional truth drawn, you know, to vanquish the enemy of illusion. But the feminine knows that this is a a collective response to, to um, a global reality that we can, only, we can only do it together. That's so comforting, isn't it? You know, tikkun olam is the, is the phrase in, in Hebrew, right, that 
the the repair of the world. You know, the, the, the legend, of course, is that when the Holy One decided to create all that is, it was because of a longing to know itself, to know itself as love, of course. And so it poured itself into these vessels. It's, and it actually contracted into, these, into a dense, dense state and then exploded. What does that sound like? And um, the Jewish Big Bang, I call it. And the shards of light and the shards of darkness scattered through everywhere, and that created the cosmos. And then human beings were, were created to restore the vessels to wholeness, to repair the shattered world, to mend the tattered web of interbeing. And we do that through every act of chesed and, and tzedakah, of loving kindness, of, of generosity, but also of wisdom and also of righteousness and also of fierce truth-telling. It's like the bird can't fly, as they say in Buddhism, the bird the bird can't fly without the wings of compassion and, um, and wisdom, yeah, being equal. And so ours, our task of repairing the world, thank God, this is not up to us alone. That's the, that's, that legend would imply that it's your job to mend this broken world. But it is the, the feminine understands that we can only do that together. Okay, two, I, I have no idea what time is because I don't have my timekeeping device. Nine minutes. Nine minutes? Okay. What did you say, Kirk? Eight minutes. Okay. So I, I think um, it's important to notice that the feminine has lots of aspects. Right. It's not just the, the, the sweet, loving, compassionate one. And that Kali is not just about, about stomping out what men have done. Kali is... A, stomps out all of our illusions, all of us who are in denial, all of us who are lost. And um, taking in those different aspects of the feminine and the masculine has been very healing for me yeah. as, a, as a woman. And I don't think it has to be, I only get to heal through the divine feminine. I'm healing now and trying to balance, which Carl Jung said is what happens in the second half of life is you balance the, the masculine and feminine qualities and integrate them. So um, I just want to hold that space for that. Thank you. I recommend this book here, Wild Mercy. I make that case. But thank you. Well, um, my comment is related to our earlier conversation. Um, but on the night that Donald Trump was elected, the face of Kali appeared on the Empire State Building. Right. And, uh, and I thought, you know, the comment that was made was, you know, believe me, at this time you've opened the door for Kali to enter our world. So I thought that was very interesting in regard to speaking about the fierce qualities of the feminine. Yeah. But the question I had prior to that was, before we came here, upstairs, um, we heard two wonderful presentations, one by Layla June, um, a wonderful woman of Navajo tribe. And I take full responsibility for bringing Layla June. Oh, thank you so much. She Welcome. was wonderful. And she was immediately followed by Peter Russell. Yeah. And their two presentations were so contradictory in a way to each other because his was you know, computers are getting faster and faster and the world is going to go faster and faster. And, you know, I could just see this whole unfolding of a digital kind of reality in contrast to the way she spoke about the future and, and the present. And I wonder how you see those two pictures evolving. Do you, do you see that happening simultaneously or one taking down the other or... So encapsulate for me what you see as Lila's version of what's going oh, on right now. Because Peter, Peter, by the way, he, so he said it's all, it's all speeding up. The technology is it's just Faster speeding up. Right. Us. But he also said consciousness is rising right. in, yeah. yeah. So, so I think of consciousness rising being the balance mm -hmm. that we need between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but it felt to me one 
one was so taking away from our attention to the world and to the earth and the creatures through mm -hmm. the speeding up of things and the attention to digital devices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And hers was so much an invitation to own that we belong to the earth and, yeah. and you know, just the whole beauty of, of her teaching. Mm -hmm. So I felt a contradiction, mm -hmm. especially until Peter at the end brought in the consciousness piece. Yeah. But I do see that happening, both happening kind of simultaneously, and I wonder about your perspective on that. Yeah. Um, I am very hopeful. This is a good note on which to end, to close, to draw toward a close, is I am very hopeful that what he called consciousness, and I would call love, which are the same thing, I think, in a way, um, is, is prevailing even though it doesn't look like it. Like if you look at the news and you look at the sort of the evidence, it's, um, it looks like hate and duality and divisiveness and, um, you know, what is it called? Inventing the truth and all of these things that are, that are so obvious, fundamentalism in religions is, is, dominating but I think that the very nature of love is that it's it's comes from deep in the belly of the earth it's a what it's a wellspring it's an aquifer and that it's seen it's not as visible but it's it's bubbling up and it's rising and I'm seeing it everywhere in communities in small circles of human beings who are coming together to become more human and we're doing it in all kinds of ways that are not necessarily visible, but, but I think it's, it's the much stronger reality. And so that when things begin to come undone, what's going to hold us is this web of interbeing that has been carefully woven by love all along that's going to receive us and is available to us right now to sustain us as we step up to mend the world. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, my loves. Yeah.